And Alessandro Lombardi, senior accelerator physicist here at CERN, is going to answer this question 10 meters away from me, right there, at the source. Over to you, Alessandra. So, hi everyone. Where do all the protons come from? Well, they come from this bottle over here that uh, you can see on my left hand side. And on my left hand side, you can see the source of LINAC4, brand new LINAC, a uh, source that will produce H minus. It's a special ion, a proton with two electrons attached that will travel for. Um, almost 200 meters to reach the PS booster and become a proton. Now let's uh, follow the tip of the, we are seeing, uh, in the, the ions and we, exactly what was inside the source. Come over, you yes. can say there. And Perfect. So what, what we see here is the very first stage of the acceleration until 3 MeV. At this point, uh, the particles have an energy that is, as I say, only 3 MeV and have a speed that is 8% of the speed of light. 8 meters here are equivalent to 100 meters in the LHC. So let's turn let's around. Let's walk along together with the particles. Let's walk along together with the particles. And what we see here is the first uh, accelerating structure, the drift tube LINAC. It means drift tube, <coughs> is that? Drift tube, yes. It's a, a, a traditional LINAC with uh, special tubes inside that provide uh, the acceleration of the particle. We have about uh, 128 uh, such uh, tubes inside. As you can see, if you count uh, the stems that uh, holds the, uh, each of the drift tube, and inside each of the, of the drift tube, we have a very small quadruple, so, so small I could almost carry it in my pocket. Like a size quadruple. Well, maybe a just a slightly bigger, but not that much. <laughs> As you have seen here, we have, changes, changed, yes. we have changed. What structure. do we have? We have a special structure. It's called cell-coupled drift tube linac. It's still somehow a drift tube linac like the one before. But as you see, the tanklets are much, much smaller, and the <coughs> The quadruples that keeps the beam focused in a small linac are housed in between the, the tanks. Uh, uh, okay, okay. Not, uh, not anymore inside. As you can see, this one is more difficult to put it into your pocket. And this is all made at CERN, all these uh, drift tubes and special components. Well, there is a, a lot of innovation uh, in the prototyping, I guess, uh, done at CERN. There is a lot of innovation. There is a lot of prototyping for all the structure. This particular structure here, though, was... <coughs> done in collaboration with uh, a, a laboratory in, in, uh, in Russia. In Russia, okay. Uh, here we, are, we have another structure, LINAC4, it's a, it's a LINAC of collaboration. We have many collaborations with many labs around the world. The structure here is a very special name, it's called the PIMS structure. There are 12 such shiny modules in the, in the LINAC4, and uh, these, these modules bring the energy from 100 MeV to the final energy of 160 MeV, half of the speed, the speed of, of light. light. So already here, uh, the particles are half at the speed of light, but they are still H minus. They are still H minus. They are not still, yet protons. Not yet protons. They will still be H minus for another uh, 200 meters. And where does the transformation happen? The transformation happens right at the injection into the booster. We will go there later. Uh, but I think that we can already start uh, asking a few questions about uh, this fabulous uh, linear accelerator. As I was saying before, it's brand new, it's the newcomer, although it's uh, at the first stages of acceleration. And we have a few questions from Twitter. Uh, uh, one, one question that is out of curiosity, I, I guess I would also ask the questions if I were watching. Why is it called LINAC4 if it is right at the beginning of the chain? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's called the LINAC-4 because it's the fourth linear accelerator in uh, CERN. It is at the beginning of the chain of proton, but it's the fourth LINAC. We had uh, in the uh, history of CERN, we had LINAC-1, LINAC-2, that has been uh, just decommissioned, LINAC-3, which uh, accelerates uh, lead ions, so heavy ions, and this is LINAC-4 because it's the fourth okay. LINAC. So LINAC-1, 2, and 3 have accelerated protons. LINAC-1 started in 1958. Exactly. It's been decommissioned, uh, replaced by LINAC-4. 
um, and, uh, and LINAC-3 exists, it's not far from here, and it injects heavy ions, the lead ions uh, for the LHC, right? Exactly. Whereas this one, before getting to the LHC, we will see how many stages there are. Elisa is asking a question, at what speed will LINAC-4 accelerate protons? Uh, Okay, so the, the, the H minus uh, at the end of the DINAC are at 50% of the speed of light. So imagine 50 meters uh, of this, uh, the, this photon will travel 50 meters when in the LHC they will travel 100 meters in the, in the same time, just to give you an idea. Okay, and uh, are there already particles inside right now? In this, in this very moment, no, we couldn't be sitting close by <laughs> and, yes. uh, and shutting away. But uh, very soon, uh, during the summer, we will have particles all the way <clears throat> to the dump that, that we can see down, down there. And then uh, towards the end of the year, we will actually inject them into the booster. From okay, 2021. let's along. Uh, you mentioned the dump. So um, talking about technology, because people are also interested uh, in, the, in which way these are new technologies compared to the previous one. Why did you have to upgrade uh, this machine? So why did we, we, we change from Lina 2 to, to, to Lina 4? Well, <coughs> there are three main uh, novelty in, in LINAC-4, first is the particle, is an H minus, so in, instead of protons, then the frequency, the frequency is 352 megahertz, so it, the frequency that was used in, in LAP, uh, it's twice as much uh, the, the, the frequency of the, of the old LINAC-2, which allows us to uh, get to uh, a higher energy, 160 MeV, in uh, about twice its length. We are now on, at another crucial point. We just uh, passed the green block, which is the dump, yes. which you use when something uh, goes wrong or when the beam is not nice, right? Not, not only that, but uh, also when we want uh, to just uh, <coughs> uh, set up the LINAC and we don't send the beam to the booster, then we have to, we can send the beam on the, on the dump. During the whole commissioning time, the beam has ended up on this dump. There is also another line stopping right here. Exactly. So this is a parasitic line. Uh, you see this is the main line going to the booster. This is a parasitic line where we can do measurement. And where in the past uh, we have also sent a very low intensity beam for <coughs> some study that were related to medical applications. And finally, this is the, the long uh, line starting at the source and ending up all the way into the LHC with the beam pipe, which is always the same, connecting all the accelerators. And this, where does it go? Where is it going? So this part, this uh, beam line is going to the booster. You can see down, uh, down the hole there are still another 20 meters here, then yeah. the, the beam the goes, stretch. The, it's the really the, the last stretch before connecting to the, to the lines that uh, were already there and bringing the, the, the protons from LINAC2 to the, to the PS booster. You can see that the beam goes uh, up the step, it's 2.5 yes. meters. Yes. Uh, Usually we, all, we all think it's going down, but it's actually going up. This time it's going up? Yeah. And uh, maybe we can... Uh, at, the, at this cavity here, another shiny cavity, the same as the uh, PIMS, so pi mode structure, this cavity here will uh, regulate the energy dispersion of the beam to match it perfectly to what is needed to the, uh, in Perfect. the PS booster. Fabulous. And uh, where, do, where is the transformation happening from H minus into protons? Not yet, not yet. When, when, uh, the beam is still to go through the wall and travel another about 100 meters before the two electrons are stripped off the H minus and transforming it into protons. So uh, this is going through the wall. And we sent through this wall a colleague of mine, Loic Bommersbach, who is also our social media manager. And uh, we recorded this clip before confinement, so Loic is not wearing the mask. Let's find Loic through the wall and see what's behind it. And we go back. <laughs> Hello from the other side of the wall. This is the transfer line from LINAC4 to the PS booster. If you want to know more about this machine, then follow me to the next step. 
and we are now in the PS Booster. This is really a unique machine. It has 150 meters in circumference, started operation in 1972. And why it's unique? It's because of the four beam pipes, one at the top of the other. Over to Parla and the guests to give more detail about this incredible machine. And we just made it. <laughs> We'll be running 86 meters all the way back to our stage at the beginning of Linux 4. I'm with Alessandra and we are continuing our Q&A before getting to our next guest, uh, that is uh, your colleague Giovanni, Giovanni Rumoro. I hope Giovanni is there. In the meantime, so I have three questions. Alessandra, is there any new project after Linux 4? Is it foreseen already? Well, uh, if you... If you're asking about uh, linear accelerator, we should uh, certainly have a lot of uh, studies. And uh, maybe the next uh, Linux will be called uh, Linux 5. We don't know. Yeah, it might be. Yeah, we, it we might be. Know. For the moment, this is brand new and uh, it's foreseen to be working for how long? Uh, at least for 20 to 30 years. At least 20 years. Okay. Gerardo is asking, what's the most important thing or skills scientists have to be to become part of CERN? Uh -huh. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I guess uh, to be passionate, to be competent, and uh, many other things. There are, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, skills and abilities that are needed at CERN, from uh, vacuum technology, to, co to computing, so it's not just one skill. Yeah, this is a, really a city of science. You can do your PhD thesis here. You can come as a summer student, as a technical student. There are many, many possibilities. Look at jobs.cern, you'll find the answer. So somebody say, why only 8% of the speed of light? We didn't say 8%, we said half of the speed of light here, right? I think what, uh, what this person is asking is, uh, I, I spoke about 8% of the speed of light at this very point right here. Well, when the particles are born, they are very, very slow. And this is why we have to accelerate them first with a linear accelerator. And we cannot inject them directly into a circular accelerator. You need a, you need a certain minimum energy or minimum speed to inject into a circular accelerator. So we've seen, Loic, uh, in the transfer line from here to the PS booster. And this stopped just at a location where you could see that the booster is quite special. It has four beam lines, one on top of each other. I think this is unique in the world, actually. Can you tell us more about that, Alessandra? Yeah, the, the booster is very unique. First of all, it's, uh, four, uh, it's like four circular accelerators, one on top of, of the other, as you say. Um, the, the beam from the LINAC gets uh, uh, cut and distributed into the, into the four rings that then get recombined after acceleration for injection into the PS. Okay, so it, 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 what is the acceleration that they get in the booster? So the, the booster has been uh, upgraded as well, and the, the um, protons are accelerated from 160 MeV until 2 GeV. So it's a new energy. The, the booster is already the booster is there since 1972. It has uh, its output energy has already been upgraded twice. And the reason always is to uh, uh, ease the injection into the PS by reducing the uh, space charge for at the, at the injection into the next synchrotron. As we said before, we are here because there is a, a long shutdown underway. There is a lot of work going on. And uh, uh, what is the work foreseen for the booster during this period? So the <coughs> because the booster has been there already for a while, uh, while Linux 4 is, is brand new. But you're upgrading the booster as well. So two major upgrades in the booster, the injection system and the RF system. Uh, work has already been uh, going on through, through all uh, LS2. And uh, as I said, maybe already before, we, pl uh, the, we plan to inject uh, the beam into the booster towards the, the end of the year. Okay, so before going to Giovanni, who is our first uh, virtual guest on Zoom, we are still going to follow Loic, who recorded a clip uh, in the transfer line from the booster to the proton synchrotron, the first uh, large circular machine of CERN. 
and uh, we'll see uh, what it looks like. Over to Loic. And we are now in the Proton Synchrotron. Right here, this is the transfer line from the PS booster here to the PS. I will explain you how does it work. Follow me. Right here, this is a switch yard, like a railway switch yard. But instead of distributing trains, we distribute beam trains to other, to many other, to all the locations at CERN. And right here, this is another transfer line from the PS to the east area with dedicated experiments. Because we've seen after the boost that the first circular accelerator, by the way, as I was saying before, the protons into these machines, on the way, they are extracted to serve other experiments. So ready from the booster, there's an extraction that goes into Isolde experiment. And then from the PS, there are many extractions, uh, various beam lines for experiments. But let's talk about the PS with Giovanni. Do we have Giovanni? Yes. Hi, Hi Giovanni, can you, can you hear, hear me? me? Hello. Okay, Giovanni, so we've just seen a glimpse of the proton synchrotron. Can you tell us more about uh, this machine? When was it created, how big it is, and what it is for? Yeah, of course. So the proton synchrotron, the PS, it was, it's uh, actually the oldest machine at CERN. It was built in um, 1959. It's still working nowadays. And of course, I mean, it has to work up to 2040. Uh, it's uh, the, the proton synchrotron. Basically, uh, it receives protons from the PS booster at 2 GeV in the future. It will accelerate to 26 GeV, basically the speed of light already before injecting into the SPS. Um, so, uh, of course, I mean the PS doesn't serve only the SPS, but it serves also a number of experiments. So there's, for example, the experiments um, in which we create antiprotons. The antiprotons are decelerated in another decelerator, in this case, the antiproton decelerator, and they are recombined with the, um, uh, with the, with the positrons in such a way as to, uh, to, to produce um, anti-hydrogen atoms. So basically, the, 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 some, the, 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 like the, the hydrogen, but the antimatter counterpart of the, of the, of the hydrogen. Um, there are also other experiments like neutron time of flight, so there, there's, uh, there's space for neutron physics, uh, and there are also other experiments like cloud experiments that takes place in the east area of the of the PS, uh, which which studies atmospheric um, phenomena. Zero. Okay, Giovanni, uh, can you explain the difference between a linear and a circular accelerator? Why do we have uh, the two? Sure, so a linear accelerator, in a linear accelerator, the beam basically goes only once. It's just a single pass accelerator. So the beam goes once through the RF structure that accelerated, and, uh, and then it's transmitted to the next stage of acceleration. In a linear accelerator, actually, the beam goes several times through the, uh, through the same accelerating structure. And through this trick, basically, we manage to accelerate to much higher energy than in a linear structure. Largest, the most powerful in the world. Today, it's an injector to the LHC. It's also been undergoing through a few upgrades. Uh, why and what kind of upgrades? The PS had to be up upgraded, of course. So first of all, because the PS booster was upgraded to a new ex extraction, e extraction energy, the 2 GeV. So this means that the, the protons now they are injected into the PS at a higher energy. So we had to renovate completely the injection region of the PS to accommodate this new injection energy. 
Um, then, of course, I mean, we, we need also, since we are also aiming at having um, higher intensities going through the accelerator, we had to up, also to upgrade the RF system in such a way that we can stabilize the beam more powerfully against possible instabilities. Okay, now I have two questions. Maybe we can share they're similar. Maybe for uh, Alessandra, because it's about Linux 4. Valentin Bonvin, thank you for um, asking this question on LinkedIn. What is the percentage of beam losses during the acceleration phase in Linux 4? It's quite a technical question. Thank you, Valentin. So, thank you, Valentin, for, the, for this question. Uh, we have a few losses at the, at the very beginning of the acceleration. Uh, at, between uh, the source and this very point here that I am uh, indicating. And then we have uh, very few losses, like um, less than 1% all the way to the booster. Okay. Uh, is Giovanni still there? I'm here, yes. Have any particles ever escaped outside uh, any of CERN's uh, machines? <laughs> It means, well, it depends what it means outside. Of course, I mean, we have beam losses, minimal beam losses, but usually we also have um, um, some elements that are designed to intercept protons that we lose. So they are the so-called intercepting devices that can be dis beam disposal devices like beam dumps or collimators. Okay, let's see if we have, uh, we normally we should have a Skype connection with a super fun. Do I, I don't know if uh, we have a question from a super fan. Lake, can you, can you let us know? Oh, not yet. Okay, not yet. So I think we can go to the next stage and join Loic in a pre-recorded clip from the PS into the SPS, in the transfer line PS-SPS. and we are now where exactly the protons are extracted from the PS to the SPS, the super proton synchrotron. So we've gone from uh, a 600, uh, more or less, uh, meter circumference accelerator, the PS, to the SPS, it was a huge jump. In the 70s, CERN needed a bigger machine, and we got it, and the SPS was, is actually seven kilometers around. And in its history, it was first built as a synchrotron, so a machine from which to extract beams and do fixed target experiments. But at some point, it became a collider. Maybe Giovanni can tell us about the history of the SPS when it was transformed into a PP-bar collider that is a proton-antiproton collider. Giovanni, yeah, it was during, yes, Paolo, it was during the 80s, basically, uh, when, uh, because the, the SPS was born as a synchrotron, as you said, but then at some point there was the idea to accelerate protons and antiprotons in, in the same beam chamber. So uh, basically the, 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 the SPS became um, a proton-antiproton uh, uh, collider and uh, it worked actually for a few years uh, as, a, as a collider before becoming again an injector for LEP. Once LEP actually be, uh, came back, came into, into operation at the end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s, then the SPS uh, became again an injector for the next accelerator. And we've seen some images of uh, Carlo Rubbia during the conference in 1983, just a year before the Nobel, announcing the discovery of W and Z bosons at the proton and proton collider that was the SPS. Then it was, once the discovery was made, it was, uh, it became back uh, a synchrotron. And uh, at some point it also was used to send neutrino beams to the Grand Sasso lab. Right, Alessandra? Can you tell us something about this period in the history of the SPS? Well, uh, <coughs> neutrino to Grand Sasso, uh, let's say some, uh, <coughs> okay, sorry. So, yes, neutrinos were uh, uh, studied and, uh, and looked at, uh, at the laboratory in Gran Sasso. 
uh, and uh, let's say the, pre the primary source was uh, here at CERN. So the, the, the neutrinos were traveling under the Earth for 750 kilometers to reach the, 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 the Gran Sasso and the detector uh, right there. From YouTube, from Bastien, what is the density of the protons in a beam and how you minimize losses? For you, Alessandra. Oh, this is a technical question. You should come and work with us. <laughs> so, seriously speaking, now we, we have got, uh, you have to imagine that every uh, injection into the booster, we inject something of the order of 10 to the 13 protons. And they are in a, in a very small volume of a uh, few millimeter, few millimeter uh, uh, diameter. So I cannot work out the density right here on the spot, but you have all the data. They are very, very dense, and uh, we have to limit the losses because <clears throat> and we have to limit and control the losses because such beam is very intense and can make damage to our accelerator. Very good. So I would like to launch a challenge to our viewers. Uh, before we see the next clip. Um, so, what do you think? How many kilometers do protons travel inside CERN's injectors? So, before going inside the LHC, how many kilometers do the protons travel before getting into the LHC inside this fantastic uh, um, injectors complex? Linear and circular ma machines, all included. And we are going now to reach another colleague of ours, Thomas, who was accelerated before the confinement period, so again, is without a mask, into the transfer line from the SPS to the LHC. Over to Thomas. from 55 meters underground and hello from 99.5 meters below ground. This is transfer line TI2, connecting the super proton synchrotron, the SPS, to the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. And this is transfer line TI8, bringing protons from the SPS to the LHC. This transfer line brings protons from the SPS to the LHC in a clockwise direction, whereas this line brings protons from the SPS to the LHC in the anti-clockwise direction. Let's follow the protons to knock on the LHC door. Of course, was a montage. We've, uh, we've of course, were there before confinement, but it's to underline that before the LHC, there is only one line one beam pipe carrying the proton beams into these machines. After the SPS, we have two beam lines because the LHC is, of course, a collider. It's not a synchrotron. So we need two parallel beam pipes feeding the beams in opposite directions where the particles collide. But I remind you, the LHC will be the subject of our next live in a few months from now. We now have with us linear and circular accelerator expert, Alessandra Lombardi, Giovanni Rumoli, and also has joined us uh, now live on Zoom, uh, Suchita. Suchita is a physicist, a theoretical physicist from India. She's an expert in dark matter. So if you have cosmological questions, uh, any questions about the physics that is being done now at the LHC and beyond, we have uh, Suchita answering for us. Okay, we have a question. Suchita, how are you there? Let's test the, the connection first. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yes, so we hear you loud Hi. and clear. Tell me first, what's, according to you, the difference between uh, an experimental physicist, a theoretical physicist, and an... Hello? Sorry, I, I, I lost your question. I cannot hear you. Hello? Hello? Okay. Uh, one of the questions uh, for you, Alessandra. So, um, do I hear the question again? 
Ah, Suchita, you're back? Very good. So we were discussing, can you hear me? Great. Okay, we were discussing the various kinds of physicists that are at CERN. You are a theoretical physicist, Alessandra is an accelerator physicist like Giovanni. Then we have experimental physicists. Just for our audience, can you tell what's the difference of what led you specifically to go into theory? <laughs> um, well, what led me to go to theory is a very good question. Um, I was, I have to say, I was very good at doing experiments, but um, I, I wanted to think a little bit more abstract and a little bit with equations and, and try to understand um, how the universe behaves, not with the help of tools, but with the help of pen and paper. Um, so the, you asked me about different types of um, physicists that are there. First of all, I have to add, we all are equally important. And everybody who's involved in doing science is needed in order to progress the field. Some prefer to do it with, uh, with tools. Some prefer to build machines and make them work. Uh, some prefer to look at what comes out of those machines, that is data analysis, experimentalists. And there are some like me uh, who basically like to understand all this uh, creation that has been done by experimentalists and beyond with the help of pen and paper and with the help of computers these days as well. So I would say, broadly speaking, this is the difference between different kinds of physicists. Uh, essentially, we work with different tools and um, we think about the universe in different dimensions. And it's all very important to put a complete picture. Okay, I have two questions for you from our viewers on Facebook. Raphael asks, what is the latest in dark matter research? A lot of things, actually. It's something that, uh, that always excites me to, to think about what we are learning about dark matter, um, not only from the LHC, not only from the accelerator, but also by looking at stars and galaxies and the universe that we have in front of us. Uh, so we have a lot of experiments that are currently going on. You're seeing LHC, which is in front of you right now, and we are in LINAC, uh, which is uh, one of the very important stages for LHC to run. Uh, we have experiments which are running up in the sky. So we have cosmological surveys, which are looking at galaxies and big structures and understanding how universe works and how dark matter influences all of this. And we have experiments which are going on underground, which are basically looking at if dark matter travels deep into the earth, can we actually detect it by looking at deep underground experiments? Uh, so we have a lot of new results from these experiments which are coming up, which are extremely interesting. But also we have a lot of new theoretical ideas which need to be explored at the experiment, which need to be tested, which means somehow we are creating more and more um, directions and, and, and more and more ideas so that experimentalists can also um, look at these ideas and look at this, this, this uh, picture of dark matter that we think could be the correct picture and understand it more and more. So it's, it's both ways. A lot of experimental results are coming in and we theorists are very excited to understand what it means to have all these results. And a lot of new theory ideas are around uh, and the experimentalists are uh, busy building their next experiments, next ideas to test these ideas. So. Thank you, Suchita. Definitely theoretical questions uh, are very popular. Uh, I have three more for you. First one is the electroweak theory verified experimentally. Well, personally, I know we got a few Nobels for it, but please go ahead. <laughs> um. So you, we, we want to know how the, how the electroweak theory is uh, verified experimentally. Um, well, we have a lot of ways to, to verify um, the electroweak theory, okay? Um, it has few very, very solid predictions. It tells you how the forces in the standard model should interact, particularly in the electroweak sector. So if you talk about electroweak theory, then you're talking about uh, the so-called W and the Z gauge bosons. So these are two of the force carriers. They talk to standard model particles and they make them behave in a very specific way. 
we can understand this 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 talking of these particles extremely precisely we can measure the masses of these electroweak gauge bosons very very precisely and therefore we know that the electroweak theory works and the finally we one of the fundamental constituents for why electroweak theory um, exists and, and works is the prediction of Higgs boson. And as you know, we found the Higgs boson at the LHC not too, not, not too long ago. This was one of the fantastic achievements that we've had. And this basically not only completes our standard model, but also makes us think that, hello, I'm told that, hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, and I'd like to remind our viewers uh, that uh, one step towards this uh, electroweak unification was exactly in one of the accelerators we just shown before, the SPS, mm -hmm. when it was transformed into a PP bar collider. Finding the WZ was the first step towards the electroweak unification of forces. One more question for you, Suchita. Have we found gravitons? Or are, any, are we anywhere close to finding gravitons? I would very much like to say we found the gravitons, but unfortunately not. So far, we are still looking for uh, any of these mysterious particles, particles beyond the standard model. Um, but we haven't found them, no, not yet. Um, but we are looking for them, and, and, and probably there are, uh, there are new surprises coming up when we, when, we, um, when we upgrade the machine and build it and start up again. So as of now, Unfortunately, we don't have gravitons for you, but uh, definitely hope that sometime in the future there will be new discoveries, new particles, and new mysteries for us to understand. Before going to the next theoretical question, I have a very much more uh, practical question, uh, Alessandra. They are asking us uh, what are the, what are the uh, measures that are being taken during this uh, post-confinement period to work here in the tunnel at CERN? Okay, yes, after the post-confinement period, uh, we restarted activity in the, in, the, in the tunnel, and of course not in the usual way. As you can see, we are wear, wearing masks, and uh, our technical coordinator has, uh, uh, tries to you know, organize the different activities so there is a minimum number of people in the tunnel at all times. We respect, we put uh, face shield when we get too close, to each other for a longer time, and in general, we respect all the rules that have been worked out by the management and the HSE. This makes things, uh, let's say, possible to continue and continue working on this CERN, a very important activity, also in this difficult time. Uh, there is another question for accelerator physicists, I would say. Uh, is there a different process for generating antiparticles, uh, considering that they take a lot of energy to produce, and how are they used in collisions? Okay, yes, it's definitely a different um, uh, way to generate a particle and to, to generate antiparticle. Right here we have H minus, so it's a proton with two electrons uh, uh, attached. It's a, it's a particle, it's not a, an a antiparticle. In, uh, when antiparticles are, are generated by a completely different uh, uh, means and uh, not here at Linux 4. Okay, now, next two questions, I guess, they're both for Suchita. First is, how much energy uh, do we have in an LHC collision? And can you find an example of a common event with a similar amount of energy? Oh, <laughs> actually, I, I, I think this is a question for a theoretical, I'm sorry, for an experimentalist, because um, I, if, if, if you, it, it would be, I have to admit that it would be difficult for me to relate the, the, the amount of energy in one LHC collision uh, with an ordinary event. But I think I'm, I'm pretty sure that some of the, 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 the experimental experts would know about this. I'm very sorry that I don't know the answer to this question. Okay, next question from Mauricio. The Higgs boson was a great discovery, one of the great achievements of the LHC. What other discoveries do you hope to make of such magnitude and for which you are preparing?
the short answer is anything that we have not um, seen so far, right? It could be any event, um, need not necessarily be a specific particle, uh, but something new is a, a fantastic thing for us because it, it brings us new questions and these new questions or the answers to these questions is what, what excites us to work on, absolutely. Personally, for me, I want to see dark matter. I want to see what it is made of. We know that there is a lot of dark matter in the universe, and we have done a huge amount of effort in order to find it. And so far, we haven't found um, what dark matter is made up of. So I personally want to see what dark matter is at LHC. But um, really speaking, anything that we haven't seen so far, something completely new, something that is not described by our standard model, would be a very fantastic thing. So we, from the theory side, are preparing on several different uh, fronts and several different ideas. It could be a new theory of particle physics. It could be uh, that particle physics theory, including dark matter. It may not include dark matter. It can include um, several kinds of new particles, can include many dark matter particles. At the moment, uh, these are all new questions. These are all open questions. And uh, we really look forward to what Alexi has to tell us about it. That's great. Thanks a lot, Suchita. My next question is for you, Alessandra, from Rafael. Thank you for the question, first of all. In addition to using protons for discoveries, there are also very practical applications, like in the medical field. Is that true? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, many of you have heard about uh, hadron therapy. So using protons to... <clears throat> to cure uh, a tumor, to cure a cancer. Uh, part of the technology developed for, for Linux 4 has been kind of transferred to society exactly for the, for the purpose of um, uh, setting up facilities based on Linux Accelerator to treat tumors. And here at the very Linux 4, we had uh, some uh, small experiment to validate some of the choices of this, uh, of this facility. Okay, there's another one for Sujita. <laughs> What's the current progress in the search for physics beyond the standard model? Maybe you can say a few words about the standard model first for everybody to enjoy your answer. <laughs> okay, so... Um... We know that we live in the world of particles, okay? Things that you and me are made of at its very uh, fundamental level are made of different particles. And currently we have a theory, we have a mathematical understanding of what these particles are, um, how they behave and how they talk to each other. So this theory, this equation or this set of equations is what is called as the standard model of particle physics. Um, we know it's not complete because we see a lot of things like dark matter, which are not there in, in the standard model. So when we look at LHC or we look at the data from LHC, we very much want to, to understand where standard model does not work. We, if you wish, we want to prove that the standard model is wrong or is incomplete and to see something more beyond what we understand. So from this point of view, we are looking for several different kinds of events at the LHC. Uh, we look, for example, for uh, events like the Higgs boson, but with masses which are larger or smaller than Higgs boson, uh, or Z boson. So these are what is called as extended gauge theories. Um, and so new types of gauge bosons in general. We look for things like supersymmetry, uh, things where you have uh, missing energy or where you see unseen particles in the final state. Um, and we also look for what is called as flavor physics, which is a very important and heavy ion physics, which are very important programs at the LHC, which basically look at um, how the standard model particles talk to each other and, and, uh, and try to, to see at a very minuscule level if we have new physics, uh, which can be, uh, which is beyond the reach of LHC, but can be looked at at flavor physics. And finally, you have things like heavy iron, where you try to recreate the conditions of the early universe as much as you can in order to understand uh, how the, the 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 squarks 
or these uh, elementary particles that we have behave at very, very high temperature. So in terms of this physics we understand in model, all of these experiments can give us something or the other. Um, unfortunately, so far we don't have anything, but we really, really we hope that sometime in the future, uh, one of these experiments tell us where to go. Thank you, Suchita. This is a great way to conclude our live for today. We started with a very practical hydrogen bottle with Alessandro at the beginning of the itinerary. We end up with physics beyond the standard model. We've covered many subjects, including medical applications. These machines are unique. We are extremely lucky and grateful to the Linux for people to welcome us here today. I really wish you good luck with the work, with the good work. Uh, we are getting ready for a bright future for the LHC to make more discovery, physics beyond the standard model, but also many more knowledge transfer, technology application, useful for society. Thank you to the technical team. We've done a great job today. It's not been easy with all the measures to respect, in addition to being in a tunnel. So thanks, everyone. And we'll give you more of this. Uh, next will be from the LHC. Thank you.